Marianne, thank you so much for joining us here no at worries. Case 20. No worries, good to be here. It's a very tricky environment, both economically and geopolitically, as we go into the 2020s. What qualities do you believe leaders of big organisations need to have in light of that? Well, you know, without it being obvious, and it's often said, I think diversity is just going to become more and more important. And, you know, we think uh, gender diversity and racial diversity and things like that when we think about pe putting people around the table, but people from different backgrounds who bring different perspectives, who can really, and then include them and make sure that their voice is heard so that you don't go around a corner and get surprised by anything. Because if you put the right people around the table, you ought to be able to be a little bit more agile and, and deal with some of the things that I think are gonna be surprising in the coming years. When you went into the NFL, what did you find as, as a woman going into that environment? You know, Did you find it challenging and, and was it, uh, a diverse mix of people you're working with there or is that something you've helped to encourage? It, from a, it was quite diverse actually surprisingly I was surprised I mean over 35 between 35 and 40 percent of the senior vice presidents and above are women at the NFL and a lot of them are in very senior roles. Um, my biggest challenge was coming from Canada where football isn't what it is in the States so I had it and I was a casual plus fan you know I liked it and I watched it but the amount of football knowledge was staggering and just getting up to speed quickly on that um, was important. And then the next thing that I underestimated was the importance of football and the National Football League in particular to American culture and society and um, the unifying impact it can have and the soothing impact it, it can have to the culture in some, in some spots was really um, astonishing for me coming in and it's a, it's a source of pride for the league so it's um it's it's important and when we think about our brand going forward it's a big part of it obviously a huge part of nfl is it's data business if you like and the media business that, that re revolves around that and relies upon that talk to me about that and how you've seen developments in terms of the use of data and, and what that brings to a business like yours right so we've really um stood up a large data and analytics group that's increasingly important for us and we um you know, we have almost 100 million fans in our database. We have about 180 million fans overall. And we understand how those fans transact with us. If they buy tickets, if they buy tickets on the secondary market, if they buy consumer products, if they play fantasy. And how, and then we have owned and operated media assets, digital media assets like NFL.com and the club websites. So we know how they consume our product digitally. And then we under we try and understand what makes a fan in kind of the casual area move to being more avid. How do you get a fan who watches on Sunday and maybe surfs for statistics, what piece of information do you serve them and where to get them to play fantasy or to get them up that avidity curve where their value to us is greater? And so that's how we've really used our uh, big data. We call it mass intimacy. How do you reach out to a mass with a message that's tailored and intimate and effective. And how does that make them feel and, and make them engage with you, I guess, in terms of their access to you? They feel part of the family. The, yeah, I mean, they feel part of the family and they're getting relevant information around the NFL and we're trying to serve up, serve up information to them that they would otherwise have gone out and sought, you know? And it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it is a big family. I mean, they say football is family, right? But it, on the big data side, it really is about giving them what they want, where they want it, when they want it. And do you see any, pardon the pun, curve balls coming from that and, and, and what you see them demanding of you in, in the 2020s? Are they starting to expect more because of that relationship? Well, I think that the curveball that I would expect has really already been thrown, and that is um, more people not, you know, sort of opting out of season tickets and buying a la carte. So that that is really integrated with big data because the secondary ticketing market is really expanding, not just for sports but across all entertainment um, areas, and understanding who is buying those those tickets. Uh, is really, really important so it doesn't become a black box. So if you buy season tickets for the Giants and you say, okay, well, I'm going to put one weekend on the secondary market, I want to know who's in that. I, me, at the NFL, want to know who's in that seat. I want to know their age, their gender, where they live, and all that kind of information so that they can be part of our database and part of our family because 
a person who's buying one Sunday on the secondary market may buy season's tickets in a couple of years, may want to engage in us in a different way as well. One of the other key themes at this conference, as well as digital and data that we've touched on there, is, is responsible investing. Mm -hmm. How much demand do you see from your customers in terms of that and consciousness of environmental impact of something like your sport and, and your business? I would generally, uh, we feel a lot of obligation around social impact, and that is where we focus. And. Um, Certainly around our assets, like when uh, owners build stadiums and things like that, in their own way, they, they deal with the environmental impact of those asset developments. At the league level, it's really social impact. And we've learned a lot over the last couple of years around the importance of social responsibility. We have leaned into our Inspire Change campaign around social justice and criminal justice reform. We're doing that with a group of players called the Players Coalition. And we've, we're investing tens, almost $100 million in um, that kind of effort. And let me tell you, it real change is being made, like legislation is being introduced and um, you know, lives are being changed in the country because of the work that the players and the owners are doing in that area. And it's, it's really important to us, not just, you know, it's good for business. It's just good for business. You know, we talk about the battleground for the young fan. They want a brand who stands for something more than making money and more than playing football. And is that a generational shift, do you think, as well? That's what perhaps a, a younger generation expect. I think, that, I think that football and community has always been important in, in kind of our space. I think that it's maybe a little deeper now and the expectations are a little higher. Just finally, this is an investment conference. You're coming from a slightly different part of an in industry other, to the, other than that. But what would you hope you'd be able to impart to this audience about best practice, if you like, and going forward where the opportunities are going to lie? Well, I think I would say if I, um, if I were an investor, knowing what I know now, I, I think in the future, the cultural relevance of your brand, is, of the brand of the company that you're investing in, is going to become increasingly important. And, and however you generate cultural relevance, whether it's through adjacency in music and fitness and fashion, like that's how we do it. But you cannot just be one product to one person anymore. This next generation of consumers demands a brand that is relevant to them. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, Fantastic no worries. Okay, insights. thanks.